Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our XCOM Enemy Within Iron Man Impossible walkthrough. In the last episode, we began to speed up the pace a bit, we completed not one but two successful missions, and we unlocked the Mental Minefield achievement in the second one. And today it looks like we will be going for another one, because at the end of the last episode we encountered a small scout UFO, we shot it down and we saw that there are only six enemies at the crash site, and most of you agreed that this would be a perfect opportunity for Andrea to attempt to grab the Lone Wolf achievement. For that, she needs to clear the crash site all by herself, so let's see if she can do that with her fresh new suit of armor. And I went with pink here, because honestly, why not? She's going to clear a UFO crash site all by herself, she might as well look fancy doing it. Come in, HQ. Big Sky has reached the outer marker. Approaching the crash site now. Strike team is awaiting your orders. Affirmative, Big Sky. Strike one is free to engage hostile targets at the crash site. Right, so here we are, and from here on out we want to proceed very, very carefully. For this mission to go smoothly, it is important that we detect enemies on their turn and ideally land a reaction shot in the process, which is why we will only move up Andrea a few tiles each turn. This also means that Meld is very much a secondary objective in this mission. Yes, she can grab it even though she's in a mech suit, but we will only go for that if the risk is minimal. And speaking of Meld, after an uneventful first turn, we do catch a glimpse of where that first container might be hidden. However, we also have an alley over to the right here that I do not want to peek into too early, so let's stay back a bit at least for one more turn. The melt is then revealed and with four turns we do have some time here. On the alien turn meanwhile we hear that there might be someone down in that alley and the second melt container also appears to be somewhere in that direction. For the moment though, let's move up, just one single tile. If the mission briefing was correct, we will either be running into a mechtoid sectoid combination soon, or into a pair of heavy floaters. And it looks like we have found the mechtoid and its sectoid companion, and even better than that, the reaction shot also goes against the much tougher enemy. Right, 10 points of damage, that is fantastic, the mechtoid is on overwatch though, but that is something that we simply have to live with. Our hit chance from here is horrible and we need to finish this as quickly as possible, so let's move up and take the risk of getting hit. Right, so good start to the mission there, Andrea gets lucky and dodges the reaction shot. And while we could now go for the kill using the kinetic strike module, we will instead use electropulse. This will deactivate the magtoid and kill the sectoid, which otherwise would have survived. On the next turn then, before we go for the punch, we have to go for the melt. Luckily the magtoid stands right next to it, so we can grab it before we kill it. During the alien turn, we can also see that the mechtoid is glitching through the car a bit here, but simply panning the camera away for a few seconds fixes that problem easily. Now, the alien UFO with the ethereal inside is definitely not where we want to go at this point, and the second melt container is of course also not a priority. Instead, we will spend a turn reloading here just to be on the safe side, and then I would like to move towards that ruined building ahead of us because it offers some high ground, and since we still have two heavy floaters on the map, that could come in handy. Unfortunately though, it looks like we cannot catch our enemies by surprise. The floaters have found us and if we stay here, they will very likely do some damage on the next turn. So let's break line of sight instead and retreat a bit. There is a good amount of distance between us and the enemies, so they should not be able to move in and fire on the same turn. As a matter of fact, they are not showing themselves at all and we also lose the second melt container here. So one or both of our enemies might be on overwatch, which makes our next move here a bit risky. Still, I think we need the high ground if we want to win this fight, and it does indeed look like we get lucky again and our enemies have positioned themselves elsewhere. 
And it also takes a couple of alien turns until they finally show up. In the meantime, we hear some noises from the alien UFO, but we know that that's very likely the ethereal and the muton elite. So we are not moving a single inch and show some patience, and eventually that is rewarded. Now, after suffering 9 points of damage, the floater here of course decides to shoot back. Fire on this but once more, Miss Cook dodges and escapes unharmed. So let's instead now take a shot of our own. If it misses, we can still move afterwards, but it looks like that won't be necessary. So instead, we can go on overwatch, and just in time, because here comes the second floater. This time the reaction shot misses, but the floater also doesn't shoot back and instead goes into hiding. We know roughly where that is though, so let's keep up the pressure, secure another height advantage and take the shot. Now, despite the critical hit here, we do not do quite enough damage for the kill. The floater appears to be very much shaken though and spends its entire turn moving. Are attempting to retreat. Now, collateral damage would guarantee us the kill at this point, but we sadly do not have enough ammo. We could also move in close for Electropulse, but that has a high chance of revealing the ethereal. So we are not doing that either, instead we are just taking the shot. Unfortunately, that misses as well, so we now have to reload, which also gives the floater another full turn to move without the risk of coming under reaction fire. And it uses that turn to completely vanish out of sight, but we stay pretty much exactly where we are, show some patience and go on overwatch. And on the very next turn, that also already triggers, and a few seconds later, enemy number 4 is defeated. So, now comes the tricky part, we still have to take out an ethereal and a muton elite. And both of those enemies are stationary, so we can go on overwatch for as long as we want, they will never come any closer, which means we have to activate them and as a result give them a chance to react. Now luckily we have not yet suffered any damage, but let's still prepare as best as we can. A reload here puts us back up to full capacity and then we can move in and see what we're dealing with. Okay, so here we are and we still have half of our turn left. Now on the next turn we do have to kill one of these enemies, and even then we likely only have enough hit points and healing abilities to guarantee survival for two enemy turns. Now Andrea has a healthy amount of abilities that make her very durable, but both of these enemies here are also capable of a considerable damage output, so we have to act swiftly and efficiently. Now what we could do here is to simply use Electropulse to do a bit of damage to both enemies, which would then allow us to punch the Muton to death on the next turn, provided of course that it doesn't move out of range. I do believe though that the Ethereal is the more dangerous enemy of the two, so for this turn we are simply moving up into its face, so unless it moves, which is relatively unlikely I think, we can then kill it on the next turn with two kinetic strikes. Before that can happen though, we have to suffer through a healthy barrage of enemy fire, which depletes more than half of Andrea's health pool. Still, I think this fight is still very much winnable, so let's take the ethereal out of the equation. Going for the kill with the kinetic strike module thankfully also avoids the ethereal exploding upon death. Still, we are now at the muton's mercy, and it looks like our friend here is intent on taking us out. Now, as you may have noticed, our restorative mist matches the muton's damage output, and we can actually use that stalemate situation to our advantage by moving in close, healing ourselves and hoping that our enemy makes a mistake.
And speaking of mistakes, this one right here certainly was one of them. The grenade only does one meager point of damage, and that gives us the opening we need to strike again. Once again then, the Muton moves, takes aim and deals its usual 6 points of damage, but all of that is just a little too late. One more punch and the mission is over and the elusive Lone Wolf achievement unlocked. And there we are, no mind controlling necessary to get the achievement, even though that arguably makes it a lot easier. And yes, we did get lucky during the first two encounters of this mission where we suffered not a single point of damage, but I would like to think that we also had a good plan going in, and as you can see, that plan eventually paid off. Now, Andrea unfortunately suffered a few injuries and will be out of action for three days, but this should have been the last mission of the month anyway, so I'm not too worried about that. From this mission, we also obtained some melt and some damaged equipment, which we can quickly sell here. And while we do that, we can also take a brief look at panic levels, and the situation in North America remains unchanged, so just like in the last episode, we should definitely keep an eye on that. For the time being though, we have nothing else to do, so let's keep scanning and complete the next council report. Incoming transmission. We are extremely impressed with the progress of the XCOM project thus far, Commander. Your recent results were beyond our expectations, and that is not a statement this council makes lightly. Alright, another A grade, but unfortunately no panic decreases anywhere. I had kind of hoped for that in North America, but you can't have everything. Remember, we will be watching. And so, let's start scanning now and see what the new month has in store for us. And our first encounter is another small scout UFO, and our EMP cannon will be more than enough for that. There is no need to risk Near damages to the range. Fusion Lance fighter. Okay, so another six alien crash site here. Very tempting for the Rise of the Machines achievement, but I would like to complete that in one of the next episodes, so we'll just leave this one be. Shortly after then, we encounter a supply barge, and once again the EMP cannon should be enough for that. As a matter of fact, it should suffice for everything short of a battleship. Approaching target now. And as you can imagine, we will not clear this crash site either, but we have increased our UFO takedown counter to 23 now, so we're making good progress. And here we are now with a chance to decrease panic in North America. A terror mission is waiting for us in Canada, so let's assemble our usual squads, take on the aliens and see what we can find. Central, this is Big Sky. Confirm signal uplink. Strike team is in position near the terror site. Awaiting confirmation. Solid copy, Big Sky. Strike one has been given the green light. Your highest priority is to protect those civilians. And as usual, we start things off with some scouting by Luisa, and that immediately reveals the first sector part of the mission, and I have a feeling that it's not going to be the last one. We are in luck though, and can at least move everyone into some cover without alerting the aliens. Our two snipers meanwhile will go airborne, and then we put the entire squad on overwatch, and wait for the aliens to complete their turn. And we do in fact get off some reaction shots, unfortunately though it seems like one of the drones was the primary target. So at the end of the alien turn, we not only have the sector part undamaged, but out of sight as well, and we're also down one civilian. 
So, first things first, let's re-establish line of sight here, and then we can use Michelle to take out the drone and disable the sector part. This now gives us a bit of breathing room, but of course we want to keep doing damage, and from experience we all know that Mr. Wargill is always a good candidate for that. The rest of our squad can then move up a bit, and we might as well take some shots here. Our hit chances are not great, of course, but I don't think the sector part is going to move on its next turn, so putting everyone on Overwatch would likely be a bit of a waste. Ultimately then, our turn comes to an end with 11 hit points left on the sector part, so we should have no issues taking it out on the next one. And so here we go, after losing another civilian, Resilience can now start things off, and then we can go for the headshot with Michelle, which hopefully is enough to give us the kill. And that it is, and quite a bit more as it seems. Yes, it looks like it's going to be one of those missions. The sector part explosion just revealed two more of its kind standing right behind it. Fortunately enough though, they are not yet active, and we should probably keep it that way. There is also an unfortunate lack of high cover in the vicinity, so we really have no other option but to dash halfway across the battlefield with Luisa here, which then reveals the full scope of what we're dealing with. So, three more sector pods and a group of chrysalids, all clustered closely together. I will admit I was very tempted to launch a rocket at this point, but we have already used up half of our squad's moves, so I think we have to remain patient. On the alien turn then, one of the sector pods casually appears out of nowhere right in front of us, and of course that gives us a chance to strike. The chrysalids, meanwhile, make a move as well, but do not detect us just yet, and it looks like the same will be true for that second sector part here, which does not really come any closer and therefore does not detect anyone. Sector part number three, meanwhile, does come closer and thus activates, but it chooses a very good spot to do so, right next to the other sector part. So, all in all, I think it's safe to say that we have ourselves a bit of a tricky situation here, but there might be a way to solve this. Now, all of this starts with a rather risky move here, as we have to get Andrea into position for the Electropulse. And for some reason, both of the Sector Pod's reaction shots only trigger after she has reached her destination. I'm not quite sure which position the hit chance was based on, but both shots do connect, and all of a sudden, Astro Cook is left with only 9 hit points. Not only that, but she also activates the two remaining groups of enemies, so at this point the situation has arguably gone from bad to worse. Still, this is the only way of disabling the two sector parts that had already been active in the first place, so let's do that and make life a little easier for at least one turn. Following that, we can then go for a Shredder Rocket, which unfortunately only targets one of the three sector parts. We could have gone for two out of three, but Andrea would have gotten killed in the process, and I don't think we need to take it that far. And Resilius now has two shots to take against that sector pod in the back. Unfortunately though, he doesn't have the headshot back just yet, but he still does a healthy amount of damage. However, once more now, we have to expose a soldier to reaction fire, as we need Sharky Santoso's damage output here to take care of the enemy. And she does actually get lucky and dodges the reaction shot. She also saves a civilian in the process and can now take a free shot. Yeah. 
And that is a critical, which is absolutely perfect, because it means that we can now move her back out of the fray, save another civilian, and let Palladium to help us take care of the kill. And using her in the zone ability, we can now use Michelle to clean up the battlefield a bit, and we will continue to do so until she runs out of ammunition, at which point we then still have an action left to reload. Our final move of this turn is then to just take a pot shot with Annette here. She doesn't have anything else to do, and the chrysalids are still far away. Speaking of chrysalids, we can see here that one of them just killed a civilian while the other one now moves up, and that is also part of the reason why we moved back Louisa earlier, otherwise she would have likely suffered some damage now. For the two sector parts, meanwhile, we will now employ another rocket, and yes, this will kill two more civilians and screw up our excellent rating, but it's the only way to hit them both. Andrea can then follow things up with a kinetic strike, but afterwards we want to move her away from the action, otherwise she will suffer even more damage as the sector pod explodes, and let's also not forget about the two chrysalids that are still around. Heading there now. Speaking of which, one of those can quickly be taken out by Palladium Talpus, who afterwards can shift her aim over and kill one of the sector pods as well. Now, for some reason, the In The Zone ability behaves a bit weird in this game when it meets sector parts. Sometimes it triggers on a kill, other times it doesn't, even though sector parts never benefit from cover and should this always be counted as viable targets. That is a bit unfortunate, just like the fact that despite a 70% chance, Resilius does not land a critical hit here, so it looks like we have to use the services of Sharky Sentoso after all. Before we do though, let's get another civilian out of the blast zone, and then we can move in and do some more damage. Now at this point we could go for the second shot, but Annette also has one left, and she does actually hit that one to give us another kill. For some reason then, the enemy does not explode at all upon death. Either way, we still have half a move left with Louisa, so let's use that to retreat further. After all, there is still another chrysalid roaming around. At this point though, I don't think we have to worry too much about it. On the alien turn, our enemies do not even show themselves. Still, let's be careful here, patch up our mech trooper, and then send Louisa back out to scout. And she does find the chrysalid, but before she takes it out, let's also try to destroy the truck here. I'm not quite sure if collateral damage will be enough, but by now we should have at least one zombie on the map, and maybe we can establish line of sight this way. It seems though as if that is not quite possible, so let's not drag this one out longer than it has to be. The chrysalid is of course quickly eliminated, and on the alien turn, the zombie follows suit thanks to stereo reaction shots from Roselius and Michelle. And there we go, another mission has been completed. Let's return to the base. I'm certainly impressed with the results so far, especially considering the conditions down there. No injuries this time, and no valuable loot either, but we do receive a valuable panic decrease across North America. And honestly, at this point, I would like to keep scanning for a little while longer. We will be in touch, Commander. At least until we encounter the next mission that we absolutely have to take, just so that we can maybe shoot down a few more UFOs in the meantime. Incoming transmission. We are extremely impressed with the progress of the XCOM project thus far, Commander. Your recent results were beyond our expectations, and that is not a statement this Council makes lightly. Remember, we will be watching. The Council report then happens as usual, I don't think I have to say anything about that at this point, so let's just keep scanning and see what else comes up. Detected. 
Right, so first up we have a landed Skalk UFO, which we will of course ignore. And unfortunately, that is once again going to cause a slight panic increase. Commander, by ignoring these UFO contacts, we're putting our entire satellite network at risk. We have a secure transmission coming in from the Council, Commander. Following that, we also have a request for a Council mission in China. But honestly, even if we were still taking every mission, I would be very tempted to skip this one, because the rewards here are really not much more than a bad joke. Detected. A few days later then, a battleship shows up, but not in Canada, where we skip the UFO mission, but instead in the United States. This means a second battleship is on the way and we'll likely meet it in the next few days. For now though, let's start things off by taking this one out. Enemy is padlocked. We're getting eaten up here! The crash site will, as always, not be cleared, and we can simply keep scanning. Contact detected. And here we go, this is the battleship that was actually prompted by us skipping the UFO landing site mission earlier. And unfortunately, our Fusion Lance Firestorm is still undergoing repairs, so it looks like we'll have to do this with the EMP cannon. Closing on target. Thanks to the added help of the dodge module, we are successful, and that means we are now up to 25 UFO takedowns over the course of this series. A request from Russia for two nanofiber vests will then swiftly be ignored, and a few moments later we run into another terror mission, but that is going to take place in the next episode. At this point, at the rate that we're shooting down UFOs, I think we need about three, maybe four more episodes until we have 40 for the Shooting Stars achievement. And that is very likely going to be one of the last achievements we unlock before we finally jump into the final mission of the game. In one of those remaining episodes, we will then focus on the Rise of the Machines achievement and send out a squad full of mech troopers and shivs. But if you have ideas for interesting challenges that are not covered by achievements, then feel free to let me know in the comments. As I said, we should have about two episodes or so in which we can experiment a bit, as we just wait to shoot down as many UFOs as possible. So again, get creative in the comments, but above all, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you did, then I would of course be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can either subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.